Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. I'm Frédéric Desbiens, Program Manager for IoT and Edge Computing at the Eclipse Foundation. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Zeno, a next generation protocol for IoT and Edge Computing. So the structure of this presentation is quite simple. First, uh, I will explain to you why you need Zeno. There are plenty of protocols around. And uh, Zeno addresses very, very specific concerns. And so uh, we'll take the time of you know, reviewing what's on the market right now and why Zeno is in, on, on certain points, on certain aspects better. Then uh, I will give you a run through the basic concepts of Zeno. And as you will see, the protocol is quite flexible in its approach. Um, after that, we'll cover a step-by-step -step example. So we'll take uh, the Musée du Louvre in Paris and see how Zeno could help you, you know, gather data from various rooms in there. Uh, we'll review the, a few performance metrics. Uh, so the Zeno team uh, ran some benchmarks last summer and uh, wanted me to share those results with you. And finally, I will let you know how to get started because, well, I hope you will find Zeno awesome. So I will explain to you how to set up your development environment for Linux and uh, Zephyr. So uh, with that out of the way, let's get started. All right, so um, when you look at the IoT market, uh, and, and typically when you start uh, working on an IoT project, one of the choices you will have to make is which protocol or which protocols, plural, depending on, on what you have to work with, uh, you will use. And there are several mature and high quality options in the market, and I put a few of them on the slide. So uh, each of those protocols has its own approach. Uh, some of them will be request response. Some of them will be uh, publish subscribe. Uh, which is uh, typically highly useful in scenarios where you do uh, you report sensor data from the edge uh, all the way to the enterprise, and uh, you know there are uh, you know options even uh, about the topology. Some of them are client server, some of them are peer to peer, and uh, MQTT obviously is known for its brokered approach to communications. One exception here is OPC UA. Um, I wrote it's complicated here because uh, it can be client server, it can be pub sub, uh, but overall, um, given given the complexity of OPC UA, it's hard to come with a simple answer to that particular question. But anyway, with OPC UA, you certainly have options and plenty of device support. And, and each of the protocols on this slide is really a, a useful option that you should consider when starting a new project, really. Uh, now, which one you will pick depends on a variety of factors. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the kind of, of device you have in mind, constraint device, uh, the type of topology, uh, power consumption, etc., etc., and obviously the overall familiarity you could have with one or more of the, of the options on the table there. So all of them are great options, and all of them have open source implementations at the Eclipse Foundation. So in our case, for Co-op, we've got Eclipse Californium. Uh, for DDS, we've got Cyclone DDS, which is now the default middleware in the ROS2 uh, operating system. Uh, lightweight M2M, we've got uh, Leshan, which is both a server and client implementation. And then uh, we've got Wakama, which is purely a client uh, library for, uh, written in C. Uh, for OPC UA, we've got Eclipse Milo, and in the MQTT space, we have the very popular MQTT broker, uh, Mosquito, and the PAHO uh, set of client libraries in several languages that you can pick from. Uh, a new player doesn't even have a logo at this point is Eclipse Amlen. So Eclipse Amlen is another MQTT broker that we've got at the Eclipse Foundation. It's been contributed by IBM, and essentially it's a clusterable, highly available uh, broker. So Mosquito is very lightweight, fantastic for embedded deployments and things like that. And Amlen is really the thing uh, you will want to run in your data center or in the cloud. And in fact, this is what IBM is doing. Uh, they are running um, several cloud services uh, offering MQTT services using the Amlen code base, and now they are contributing that to the Eclipse Foundation. So, you know, uh, the whole point of this presentation is to tell you about Zeno 
And uh, I want to emphasize here that Zeno is certainly a great option. However, we've got uh, support for every mainstream protocol uh, that you can think about at the Eclipse Foundation. And each and every of those options is certainly a valid choice even in today's market. Now, uh, digging a bit deeper, each of the protocols I'm mentioning, you know, uh, they have limitations or you can, you can criticize them for uh, something or another. Uh, for example, in the case of CoAP, uh, there's been some research done and, you know, even though it's based on UDP, the transition times are maybe a bit higher than you would like. And then obviously, the security model is built around DTLS and DTLS has got specific limitations when working around certificates and things like that. Then in the case of DDS, DDS is an open uh, standard uh, from the op uh, object management group and it's got its own foundation in the OMG Galaxy, the DDS foundation. And, and, and all of that is great, but uh, real world users will tell you that more often than not, DDS implementations, especially proprietary ones, are not compatible with each other. And the other problem with DDS is that it's a fantastic protocol uh, for local communication, but routing DDS traffic over the public internet is tricky. And uh, you may need to do that, for example, if you have, um, you know, deployments in several factories all over the country or all over the world and you want to you know bring that traffic uh, together in a single location central location for monitoring for example um, you need to use the public internet for that and routing dds traffic in a scenario like that uh, it seems is very painful in the case of lightweight m2m one of the common criticisms is that it's tied to co-op and co-op is tied to udp so obviously if you don't like udp or if you don't like co-op lightweight m2m is not necessarily an option for you in the case of opc ua once again its uh, main uh, achilles heel is is really its complexity the spec is several thousand pages long uh, it's got six distinct transports and more than 200 facets so just saying in a generic fashion hey this product or this device is OPC UA compatible doesn't tell much. You have to dig a bit deeper and see if it implements the facets that you need. And, you know, given all of the possible combinations of transports and facets, sometimes interoperability could be a challenge. And then finally, MQTT. MQTT is tied uh, to TCP. Uh, now there's MQTT SN, which runs uh, on the top of UDP, so uh, a different approach there. But MQTT SN is literally a different protocol than MQTT. And that means that typically the mainstream options for MQTT brokers will not support out of the box MQTT SN. And so uh, you have to think about a whole different infrastructure if you want to run both MQTT and MQTT SN. So this may change in the future years, obviously, but, you know, each of the criticisms on this slide is, is probably valid and are things that the Zeno design team uh, wanted to address in one way or another. Now, if we take a step back from the very technical details, when you think about the journey of data, you know, you, you capture it at the edge on constraint devices and you bring it all the way to the cloud and here, that's uh, private cloud, uh, hybrid cloud, public cloud, whatever, okay? Um, you know, you look at this journey of data and, and really, obviously, uh, the protocols that I told you about up to now, uh, they don't concern themselves with the capture. So that's literally where your own code on a constraint device will play a role. So you have sensors on a microcontroller or something, and then you gather the data. And then in step two, you will use one of the protocols, whether MQTT, co-op, whatever, in order to transmit the data from the edge to its final uh, destination or even intermediary destinations. So most of the protocols I, I talked about up to now, they focus squarely on step number two, transmission. Now, when you think about you know, the full journey of data, there are other steps after the transmission. You want to compute the data uh, in some cases. You want to store it as is in some cases for telemetry or things like that in a time series database, whatever. Data is stored as is or after computation, but you know, those two steps are uh, really linked to one another. And finally, once you have stored the data at some point, you will want to retrieve it. Once again, maybe you just want to get through the data set 
just to check some values, or maybe you need to retrieve it for future processing, to feed uh, an AI model, for example, or things like that. Anyway, so what happened is that the Zeno team saw an opportunity in there, in the sense that existing protocols don't care about computation, storage, and retrieval. And so they wanted to, yes, have a protocol which is very efficient about transmission, but then would provide primitives for computation, storage, and retrieval. But before we get there, there's the whole uh, edge computing concept. And, um, you know, Zeno is a fantastic option for IoT deployments, okay? And at the same time, it's been designed from the ground up to address edge computing. And when we say edge computing, the first thing you should realize, well, first, uh, you know, uh, the definition for edge computing is literally that you bring s compute and storage and uh, networking capabilities as close to the, the source of the data as possible. Okay, so that's my own little definition there. A bit simplistic, but, uh, you know, if you challenge it, you will feel, uh, you will probably see that it holds up quite well. Um, the problem when we say edge computing is that the edge is a fuzzy concept. Depending on your application, depending on what you're trying to do, depending on what role you play, whether you are the end user, where, uh, whether you are the solution provider or the, the telco company, you know, the literal definition of edge will vary. So obviously, if you look on this diagram on my slide, um, on, on the right, you've got the, the constraint devices, the things that are in the field, uh, where, uh, uh, machines and even user terminals, things like that. And obviously, there is some kind of edge infrastructure over there. And then you have 5G or you have LTE or you have something that will you know, provide communication support. And then your uh, communication provider will have uh, multi-edge computing uh, infrastructure there. And then there's the core, uh, the core communications network of that provider, and eventually you will get all the way to the cloud. So where's the edge in the diagram below? The answer may vary. And this means that if you have a very rigid definition of the edge, and if you are using a protocol that has a very rigid vision on this, you won't be able to address the multitude of potential deployments, topologies, and use cases. Uh, and so the fact that the edge is a fuzzy concept uh, simply uh, complicates things a bit. Uh, the other thing is that obviously there's a lot of semantic confusion. So uh, uh, several uh, years ago already, five, six, seven years ago, we started talking about uh, fog computing. And now edge computing is rather the dominant term. And there are many, many interpretations of what edge means and fog means. And, and some people will start distinguishing between close edge, far edge, telco edge. Uh, I mean, there's a whole... Uh, semantic mess, I would say, uh, currently. Uh, but whatever is your definition of edge, or whether you prefer fog to edge or whatever, um, Zeno uh, is a good solution. And we will see uh, why uh, in, a, in, a, in a short bit. Uh, our vision in this debate at the Eclipse Foundation, and uh, specifically in our edge native working group, is quite simple. You know. IoT solutions or pure edge computing solutions that have nothing to do with uh, uh, IoT like uh, gaming edge computing infrastructure or things like that. You know, they always leverage a continuum of compute storage and communication resources that are spanning literally from the very microcontroller that your sensors are connected to all the way to the cloud. And the cloud here is private, hybrid, public, whatever. Uh, whatever cloud deployment model works for your organization. And, you know, the, the components for the various planes in your solution, whether it's the data plane, the management plane, the control plane, all of those components, they can be spread over all uh, a variety of physical locations across the edge to cloud continuum, okay? Which means that a true edge computing platform, a true protocol that has been from the ground up from the edge will be able to have the flexibility to be deployed in all of those potential locations all across the continuum as you design your solution. Okay. 
And this brings us to Zeno, because Zeno is literally the answer to all of the concerns I, I, I told you about, about current, uh, currently popular protocols, and obviously it addresses really the concerns of edge computing. So what is Zeno? Zeno is a protocol that unifies data in motion, data in use, data at rest, and computations, okay? And really it has a pop sub model, but it blends that with distributed queries. And it's got built-in support for geographically distributed storage and distributed computations, which means, you know, a growing concern in IoT and edge computing is data sovereignty. You want the data not to leave a specific physical location, for example, or you don't want it to leave a specific country. And, and this is really important in highly regulated industries like healthcare or in industries with, uh, I would say, a high potential for disruption like defense, right? You, you don't want uh, the enemy forces be able to uh, penetrate your communication infrastructure for your uh, autonomous uh, drones, for example, or things like that, right? Uh, and so uh, that's why the, the built-in support for geographically distributed storage in Zeno is so innovative and so important. So you see on the slide, uh, adopters of the technology, chief among them is ADLink. So ADLink are uh, the guys who uh, created Zeno and contributed it to the Eclipse Foundation. And among them, uh, among the authors are early adopters and, uh, you know, people that are working with the protocol on a variety of uh, use cases. And I should salute there uh, my colleagues at the Eclipse Open ADX uh, working group. So they work on tool chains for uh, autonomous driving. And essentially, uh, Zeno is certainly a very uh, important part of what they are doing for automotive in there. So uh, robotics, uh, automotive, uh, and IoT are are uh, pretty strong use cases for Zeno at this point in time, and uh, the other partners around it are certainly working on other use cases as well. So what is Zeno exactly? So Zeno is the sum of two specific APIs, you could say, or two specific layers. There's the ZenoNet lower uh, level layer, and then the Zeno layer on the top, as you see on the diagram. And here, uh, what's really interesting is really that those two are, are, are decoupled in the sense that you can just work at the Zeno.net level, or you can use the higher level Zeno API independently from, from each other. So what Zenonet implements is really a networking layer capable of running above a data link, a network, or a transport layer, which means, essentially, if I'm simplifying this, it can run over UDP, it can run over TCP, it can run over Quick. okay? So you, you really have the flexibility to pick whatever option works well for your specific use cases. Or even, you know, you can run segments of your Zeno infrastructure over different transports, and this will work uh, quite well. Uh, Zeno, uh, ZenoNet uh, also provides primitives for efficient pop sub, distributed queries, things like that, and it supports fragmentation and ordered reliable delivery. So you've got uh, a configurable uh, quality of service level, uh, so to speak, that you can uh, that you can specify when you are working with uh, the ZenoNet API. And then there's a higher level Zeno API. So Zeno uh, is a high level API for pop sub and distributed queries. It supports uh, data transcoding and uh, it's got the implementation of geographically distributed storage and distributed computations and things like that. And the two together work quite well. Zeno is uh, written in Rust. So in a security perspective, certainly you won't suffer from buffer overflows or uh, things like that. So um, this, I think, makes uh, the protocol even more attractive. And it's got a number of language bindings, as we will see later. So uh, Zeno uh, supports multiple interaction modes, and one of them is the peer-to-peer -peer mode. So either you can establish a Mac or a full clique where each of the peers is uh, linked to uh, each other. And really what makes this mode interesting is that the peers can do scouting through uh, essentially multicast or just through the gossip. So the chatter between the nodes will help the other nodes that are joining uh, the mesh or the clique, uh, figure out whatever peers are available around them. 
okay? And uh, this flexibility in scouting is really important because obviously not every network will enable you to work with multicast, so the gossip option there is certainly very attractive. And then uh, another interesting thing is that obviously uh, peers are important in, in, in Zeno's uh, architecture, but really uh, you have this option of having routers uh, around as well. And, and those routers enable you to have clients that won't be peers, right? So in this case, typically clients are smaller, uh, very constrained devices that cannot implement the full feature set. And so they implement just a subset, the client subset of Zeno. And so they can be lighter weight. Uh, and then uh, obviously the routers here are the key component that enable you to bridge various deployments over the public internet. So the peers, you know, can talk to each other on the local network with the clients and all of that. And then you can have routers in several places in your infrastructure, and those routers can communicate with each other over the public internet in a secure way. So, uh, a few other highlights about Zeno. Uh, it's been designed from the ground up for, uh, to minimize bandwidth usage, to optimize power consumption, and uh, optimize memory usage as well. And really, in, in, uh, with special attention paid to extremely constrained uh, targets. Okay? Uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, it supports PopSub, but you, know, you can implement it in two different ways. So there's the traditional push PopSub, Okay, where essentially uh, the subscribers will receive the data in real time as it is made available. But then you have the option of pull pops up. So essentially a subscriber will awake from, uh, from sleep, maybe to, man uh, to minimize uh, power consumption, pull the data updates from uh, the closest peer, and then uh, go back to sleep after that. So you have uh, both, uh, both subscriber modes that, that are possible. The resource keys, right? So the, the, the keys literally to, to, to the data that you store on the Zeno infrastructure, they are represented as integers and those are uh, local to a session, okay? And this uh, minimizes the traffic on the wire. Um, as I mentioned, support, Zeno supports peer-to-peer -peer and routed communication, so it's very flexible. So it can be exactly like DDS, it can be exactly like uh, MQTT or a mix of both. Uh, depending, uh, once again, on your use case. Uh, uh, Zeno supports uh, zero copy, uh, which makes it uh, certainly very efficient. Um, yeah, reliable delivery and fragmentation, we covered that. And finally, uh, what's really interesting about Zeno is that there's really minimal overhead for user data when it is transmitted. So typically it's around uh, five bytes, okay, uh, which is uh, quite on the low side as far as protocols are concerned. Some other protocols are a bit smaller, but given the functional uh, richness in Zeno, uh, delivering all of that in five bytes uh, is certainly quite an achievement. All right, so now let's have a little tour of uh, the primitives inside uh, Zeno. So first, how do you name data elements in Zeno? So uh, following the tradition of name data networking protocols, essentially data is always identified by a sequence of byte arrays. And in this case, that's called the key, okay? And, and the keys are always hierarchical. So in this case, we have the example of a home. So we see here home, kitchen, sensor, step. Okay, so there's a clear hierarchy there. And then you can see that home, kitchen, sensor, C202, which is our sensors for carbon monoxide and, and oxygen there. Um, and, and the data inter interest and intents. So when you make a query or when you subscribe uh, to something, you can use wildcards uh, or regular, uh, regular expressions. So for example, if I want to retrieve all the, uh, the, the, the current values for all temperature sensors in my home, I can uh, specify home slash uh, star slash sensor slash temp. And Independently of the room, I will get uh, the data uh, for all of my temperature sensors. And using two stars, like in the second example, I will retrieve all uh, the values, the current values for the C202 uh, sensors, whatever the hierarchy is. Okay, so you can use those uh, regular expressions to be very flexible in the way you are making those queries. 
Then uh, there uh, uh, you know, are selectors to define the data sets when you are making queries and things like that. And a selector is uh, always composed of a key expression and optionally a predicate projection and a set of properties. So we've got some examples on the slide. Uh, so for example, I could retrieve the current values for every temperature sensor, whatever uh, room they are in, but just if the value is over 25 Celsius, for example, which, you know, would give me the, the, the list of rooms, for example, uh, where the temperature is too high in my home. And then there's a second example about a connected car, uh, you know, on the, on the second line. But really, th those key expressions are used to route the query. Okay, the key expressions are there for that. And, and the predicate projections are interpreted only by the entity that executes the query. Okay, and as we see, in some cases, there can be several entities that can answer a specific query uh, in, in the infrastructure. So um, the fact that the key expression is used to route and the fact that the rest is interpreted by uh, the target of the query means that you've got um, a very efficient way to route the queries and at the same time that every entity will be able to interpret the query in its own way at the other end. And uh, Zeno will also provide uh, various policies to control the consolidation of query and obviously uh, calculate quorums and things like that depending on the number of nodes you have, etc. etc. So certainly uh, in that perspective uh, Zeno is uh, very, very robust. Uh, now, let's have a closer look at uh, the primitives in Zeno, and we start with uh, a set of entities. So, uh, first there's the concept of resource. So, a resource in Zeno is always a named data item, so that's a key value combination. So, for example, uh, home kitchen sensor temp, that's uh, my key, and the value currently would be 21.5 Celsius. So it's a bit on the colder side in uh, the kitchen right now. And then if I have a humidity sensor, you see the key for that as well, and that would be 67%, so that's a bit high. Maybe I need a dehumidifier or something in my kitchen. Anyway, um, now when I declare, when I create publishers and subscribers, I will use literally the same kind of key expressions uh, that I will use in uh, resources. And you see a publisher is a string of values for a key expression, uh, so it can be very specific, so we see home kitchen sensor temp, or uh, it can even be uh, a bit more generic, so you know all of the sensors in the kitchen would be represented by the second example, which is home kitchen sensor star. Okay, And the same for subscribers, so you can be very flexible in declaring both publishers and subscribers, depending on the context. Then there's the notion of queryable. So essentially, once again, you provide a key expression for a specific query. So that would be the equivalent of a named query in a, in a, in a SQL database, for example. So in this case, home star star will re return a wealth of information about all of the sensors in my connected home, for example. Okay. There are a few interesting operations that are uh, defined in Zeno. First is the scout operation. So this will look for Zeno entities on the network explicitly. Um, the type of node that you will look for can be specified through a bitmask. So you can look just for peers, just for routers, a mix of the two, etc. So that's really flexible and really interesting. Uh, so depending on the specific use case you have, you can um, tweak or, or shape the scouting in a way that makes sense uh, for the use case. Obviously, uh, open and close uh, as primitives uh, simply open and close uh, Zeno net sessions. Um, and then declare and declare are uh, you primitives that are used for resources, publishers, subscribers, and queryables. And in the case of subscribers and queryables, essentially, uh, you uh, when you declare them, you have to provide a callback that will be triggered when a data is available or when uh, a query needs to be answered. Okay, so certainly uh, Zeno is fully supportive of asynchronous programming, uh, as it should be, you know, in a, in a perspective where uh, in IoT you don't necessarily get data all the time. Uh, a few other interesting uh, primitive operations in Zeno. So write will write the data for a key expression. Pull will be the one that you use in order if you have a pull subscriber to uh, simply 
pull the data from uh, from a node. Uh, and then uh, query uh, enables you to run a distributed query and uh, there the, the target of the query, the coverage consolidation will depend on the policies that are set on the Zeno infrastructure. Okay, uh, focusing now on the concept of storage and this is uh, really something uh, innovative that, that Zeno provides. So uh, like the publishers and subscribers, um, Storages in Zeno are defined by a selector and a backend. So the selector is like any other key. So we see here my home slash status slash star star could be a selector. Okay. And then the backend for the selector can be a database engine. Um, and there, uh, currently supported options include uh, file system in FluxDB, uh, in memory hash map, RocksDB, and a variety of uh, SQL uh, databases. Um, and the support for those backends is implemented through plugins. So if your favorite option is missing there, then obviously uh, you can write a plugin to add the support for that. And um, those storage backends. Uh, uh, can be um, loaded dynamically at runtime, so you know you can add them as you go on, on uh, a node, uh, depending on your needs. Um, the storage selector here is, is really interesting. It can obviously be bound to its own little. A uh, standalone database uh, which could be created on demand, but it can be bound to existing database that you would be using for other proposals in the infrastructure. So you have the option for both there, and that's uh, certainly uh, a good level of flexibility to have. Now, uh, talking about evals. So an eval is once again defined by a selector, so that's the set of keys that will trigger that particular uh, computation in the infrastructure. And the implementation is the user code that will write in order to implement uh, you know, the computation. Uh, the implementation can be written in any language for which Zeno has a language binding. So obviously, uh, Rust, uh, Go are certainly supported options. Um, there's a Java API, C, C++, and Python. So, plenty of variety there. And once again, if an option is missing, you could have the option of implementing your own if uh, it's not there. And all of it is open source uh, as well. So this diagram really uh, show you how everything fits together in Zeno. And, and there, um, you see both the ZenoNet layer and uh, the Zeno higher level layer. So ZenoNet has the right operation. So you do a put uh, in, in, in the fuller, higher level Zeno API. Uh, the notion of subscriber queryable is obviously tied to our uh, storages uh, around there. Uh, the notion of subscriber and yet, so all of those things really you can use depending on your use case or the level of granularity that you want. You can go uh, the lower level route directly in ZenoNet, or you can use the higher level Zeno API, uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, whatever you choose to do, uh, both options are fully supported and fully documented by the Zeno team. Okay, so now let's focus on uh, specific examples. So this would be have a uh, fixtures deployment in the Musée du Louvre in Paris, where essentially I have a hierarchy of sensors on various floors and in various rooms. Okay, so for example, here, uh, if you look at the top left of the graph, you will see that we've got publishers that are under the key Louvre 142 sensor temp and Louvre 242 sensor temp. So uh, we start with Louvre, which is uh, our museum here. Uh, the first integer is the floor, so first floor, second floor. And the third value is the number of the room. So we have room 42 on floor 1, room 42 on floor 2, uh, etc. And in those rooms, we have a variety of sensors. So the publishers in the top left corner, they are simply clients, right? So they publish specific values over a specific Zeno key. 
Uh, we see that our in, in our infrastructure here, we've got a number of uh, storages. So uh, Louvre 1 star star is one of those storages. Louvre 2 star star is another one. So all of the data for the first floor goes to the storage in the top right corner. Uh, whereas all of the data for the floor two rooms is going to another storage. And then we have a number of subscribers at the bottom of the screen. So one of them is a post subscriber at the bottom left. Okay. And it's listening just for loop 242 sensor 10, so a very specific value. But then uh, the two other subscribers are our push subscribers, and one of them is listening to every value for the temperature sensors. Okay. So you have this level of flexibility and variety in the protocol, and all of this is well supported. So now, if we go ahead, okay, and um, you will see that my storages, they are defining both queryables, so you can query the database, and subscribers, obviously. Okay, and this is really important. Uh, you know, if they are just subscribing, I will just put the data in the database. I won't be able to query the database in order to retrieve the, the stored values in there. So I need to define queryables in order to query the database as well, and that's an important distinction. Uh, now, what happens, let's say, when my first publisher is publishing a value to the Zeno network? Well, in this case, uh, I get the temperature value for Louv 142, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a publish and subscribe. So the publisher just sends out the value on the nearest node, and then the value will propagate to the storage, which is interested in everything that covers Louv uh, floor 1 at the, at, the, at the top right. And then, obviously, my two subscribers uh, will uh, will get the value in in real time since one of them is literally listening to that particular temperature sensor and the other one is listening or subscribed to every uh, temperature sensor in the museum. Okay, uh, and obviously my my pool subscriber uh, doesn't get the value because it cares just about uh, the temperature sensor in uh, room forty two on the seventh floor. Okay, so now uh, another example. What happens when Louv 242 sensor 10 publishes its value? Well, then uh, obviously the, 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 the Zeno nodes will route that uh, value to the second storage that we've got on the left since it's recording everything for the second floor. And then uh, the value will be sent to the nearest node to our pool subscriber, but currently it's sleeping. So the, the, the value is kept there and, and waiting since uh, this is a pool subscriber. And then at some point, uh, that particular application will wake up on the phone and then uh, what happens is that, okay, it will do a pull on the node and then uh, the Zeno infrastructure will uh, return the value to the subscriber and then the subscriber, since it's a pull subscriber, will go back to sleep, okay? So all of those interaction modes are completely supported uh, in Zeno. Then uh, let's take a different uh, interaction there. So what happens when I run a query? And in this case, it's really interesting. So my querier, so the phone that we see on the very right uh, with the green text, okay, it runs a query for Louvre star 42 sensor tab. So essentially, this is a query for the data that has been stored, okay, for every sensors for temperature that are in rooms number 42s. Okay, and number 42, uh, uh, independently of the flow. Okay, and so you see that, okay, the query is propagating, and then, uh, you know, the data for all uh, floor one rooms will come from the first storage, whereas the data for the seventh floor rooms will come from the other storage, and all of that will be consolidated and returned to our, uh, our querier uh, on the right. Okay, so that's the types of interactions that you, you get in Zeno. And really what, what really shines in this example is how flexible the protocol is. And obviously what's missing here is a router. So all of this infrastructure that you see is really self-contained. But if I am managing all of the great museums in the world, uh, then, you know, I would have a router in the Louvre 
and then a, a, a router uh, in all of my other museums, and then all of those uh, Zeno infrastructures could communicate with each other over the public internet. Uh, specifically for clients, uh, something that uh, we have in Zeno. So if you have a very constrained device and uh, you know you want it to be as efficient as possible, uh, the Zeno team developed Zeno Pico, which really is targeted at constrained devices and, and simply offer a pure C API for pure clients. So just in C and just uh, the client mode in Zeno. So there's no support in there for peer-to-peer -peer communication. And this is what we will be using when I will show you uh, the Zephyr support in Zeno a bit later in the talk. Uh, also, uh, a new thing that has been added recently to Zeno is Zeno flow. So essentially, you know, when you have a data flow, right, you have sources that produce data, operators that compute the data and syncs that will consume that computed data. So Zenoflow is a programming framework that enables you to define data flows like that and really they will span, uh, they will span from the cloud to the device. So Zenoflow offers automated deployment and management for data flows like that and it's a new uh, feature in the, in the Zeno family. So uh, it would be uh, worthy of its own presentation. So I'm just mentioning this in passing today, but please have a look if you are interested in complex data flows implemented on the top of the Zeno protocol. Now, let's talk a bit about uh, performance. Uh, so, uh, the Zeno team back in July 2021, they ran a number of tests just on a single machine, you know, with a powerful Ryzen and 22 gigs of RAM, just to see the kind of uh, throughput we could get out of the protocol. And you see, uh, for payloads as uh, substantive, substantive as uh, 4 kilobytes or even 8 kilobytes, that uh, on that single machine, it was able to support uh, millions of messages per second. Okay, and that's just on a single machine. So you can imagine if you have uh, an even bigger one uh, with multiple uh, network interfaces and all of that, the numbers would be uh, quite higher. So the kind of throughput in messages per second is quite astonishing there. And then if uh, you think about the numbers, uh, well, the number of gigabytes per second uh, transmitted, then uh, once again, very, very uh, good uh, throughput there. And uh, certainly uh, you see that the difference between the Zeno API and the lower level Zeno Net API is not that great. So both of them are quite uh, efficient and effective. And then in terms of latency, we are comparing here Zeno and Zeno Net to Ping 2. Obviously the latency is a bit higher when you have less messages, but as you can see, starting around the 1K uh, message per second, you will see that uh, the latency is quite low, 60 microseconds, uh, which is uh, very, very, very small. And uh, you know that holds up quite well. And obviously uh, Ping 2 will be uh, even lower since it doesn't actually transmit useful data. But the fact that we are so close shows how efficient and low latency uh, Zeno is. And in this case, yeah, I'm just providing the graphs, but if you want to learn more about the testing environment, the kind of tests that the, the Zeno team ran and all of that, please get in touch with them. They will provide you the full details. Okay, now, uh, the good stuff. So I convince you that Zeno is interesting. How do you get started on uh, Linux? So in this case, it's fairly simple. If you are using uh, Debian and its derivatives, then you simply add uh, the, the, the proper repo uh, to your sources, uh, do an apt update and install the Zeno library, and you can start a uh, local router by uh, running the Zeno D command. Um, if you prefer to run the router in a container, then uh, you have the, the, the Docker command uh, to do that uh, right there. Uh, obviously, please tweak your ports according to your local environment. And uh, let's say you want to code in Python, like I will be uh, showing examples in Python in this talk, then you uh, do pip install Eclipse Zeno and you will get everything you need uh, to be uh, started. Okay, so uh, that said, 
Once you have this uh, environment running, you can use the uh, REST API of the router to test your environment. So there are a number of useful uh, initial tests you can do. So retrieve info on the local router, list the current backends, list the current storages. So just cut and paste that in your terminal and you can uh, kick the tires on your local install to ensure that everything is running, which is something that I will do uh, right away. So let's let me switch to uh, the command line. All right. So uh, in this case, I am running in uh, the Windows Linux subsystem on my Windows machine because it was more convenient to, for me to use that machine uh, for recording purposes. Um, I'm running uh, the long-term support uh, Ubuntu version, and here I just, you know, uh, start uh, the Xeno daemon there. There's no output. Uh, this is expected. And just running a few of my curl queries there just to show what's happening. So I run this query to get the status of my local router. I get the version of the code and a few other properties about it. So everything is running uh, correctly. And now uh, if I am to retrieve uh, the, the, the backends for it, you will see that by default, I, I didn't pass any parameters to the router, so it's running uh, in memory backend, so everything will be uh, hash map in memory, so a key value hash map uh, to, to, to store the information. And this means in, in turn that there are no storages defined, so the list of storages uh, is empty. So now, uh, there is a very extensive set of samples uh, that have been provided by uh, the Zeno team. So let's say I start here a little, uh, a little subscriber. Um, so let me get there. So I start this Python program to subscribe to values and you see the output of the program in there. Obviously, uh, uh, that piece of code uh, is supposed to print the data received. I don't have any data here because I'm not publishing anything. So let me get to this second window and publish something. And we will see here, we start publishing some sample data and in the other window, uh, it's been received. And obviously uh, I have a single publisher there uh, and a single subscriber, but if I were to, not this one, if I were to publish to utter um, you know, have another publisher here, uh, not another publisher, another subscriber, then obviously, uh, you know, the data will be uh, displayed here as well. And we see that, you know, we are starting at 28, 29 and everything. So obviously we missed the first messages, but it's getting everything that the other subscriber has been getting, you know, 42, 43, 44. So we are in sync there. Okay. So this is, uh, just me running the, uh, the samples that are provided uh, with the Python API. Each API has its own set of samples that you can compile and run. And obviously uh, it works uh, quite well. Okay, so let me now get back to my slides. Okay, so um, I showed the API, I showed uh, uh, the samples. Um, the samples, by the way, uh, they are completely open source as well and they ship with uh, each and every API. So if you want to have a closer look, uh, open your favorite editor and have a look at uh, the sample code. Okay, so in this case, I'm showing uh, the Xenonet samples for the Python API in my editor. And this editor, by the way, is Eclipse Teia Blueprint. So Eclipse Teia is an editor based on VS Code, but if you don't like VS Code because it's a single vendor open source project and you don't like the fact that the marketplace is owned by Microsoft, uh, Eclipse Teia is the solution for you. Essentially, it will, um, you know, it is managed in a vendor neutral fashion and the marketplace is open to all and not controlled by any single entity. Okay, so uh, really please have a look at Teia Blueprint if you're interested in that. And so, yeah, uh, every implementation of the Xeno API has got its uh, full set of samples. Okay, so 
Getting back to the slides, how do you get started on Zephyr? So in this case, you download the Deb RPM or the TGZ from uh, the Eclipse servers, or you can build it from the source, and I put links to both of those options uh, on my slides. Uh, up to now, Zephyr uh, support is uh, nascent in Xenopico. So essentially, uh, the team tested it successfully up to now on the real board in a specific Nucleo board, but you can uh, expect this list to be expanded over time. And uh, the team recommends you to work with platform IO uh, to work on your Zephyr applications uh, and Zeno together. So uh, the typical structure for platform IO uh, project is that you have a lib uh, so a folder where you will put your uh, various libraries and then in SRC main you've got your main and you can add your, your C files over there. So. Uh, to get started, you just create a project directory, uh, you run platform IO in it and uh, uh, dash B and, and the identifier for the board you're targeting. So uh, using a different board, you can list uh, the boards supported running the platform IO boards command, and then you do a platform IO run. Okay, and uh, to be fully ready to work with uh, Zenopico, then uh, you need to run to copy a few files in the correct locations, and then you add obviously your code in the main file and obviously to other files as your application requires, and then you do platform IO run and platform IO run and uh, uh, dash t upload in order to flash the board and run uh, the code on a specific board. Okay, so I included a few code snippets uh, and they are for illustration purposes only. Please refer to the actual version on GitHub or, you know, read them using your favorite editor. Uh, in this case, I removed uh, the includes and definitions and things like that uh, just so that the code fits on the slide. So this is the basic Python code for subscribing. So at the top, we've got our uh, callback and then uh, we simply initiate the logging, open a Zeno session, specify the reli reliability mode and the fact that we are a push subscriber and then simply declare the subscriber and we're done. So as long as this program is running and this is literally the sample I ran a few, a few minutes ago, uh, you will get the data. Then, uh, this is the same in Xenopico, so in C, so as you can see, uh, well, a bit less readable since this is C, but, um, you know, quite, uh, quite simple there. You, you will not just need to add some kind of loop uh, uh, where I put that comment, since uh, essentially, uh, if you run it as is without putting a loop, then you will just declare a subscriber and then undeclare it and close the session. So, uh, in, in the official sample, they are just awaiting for a keyboard input there. Uh, and then the, the, the data will be displayed as it is received. And this is the basic code for publishing. Uh, so once again, uh, quite simple in Python. And uh, the same in Xenopico. So once again, uh, nothing too complicated there. And you will notice how consistent the, the, the API is from one, uh, one version to another. So, uh, I use the full fat uh, Zeno Python API and I use obviously Zeno Pico for C in the case of Zephyr and you know, everything is consistent and well documented. So uh, kudos to the team. Okay, all this work on Zeno and many other projects are happening at the Eclipse Foundation in our Edge Native Working Group. And the focus of the Edge Native Working Group is really to to foster the evolution of Zeno and many other projects. We are code first and we care about edge ops and edge ops is simply the fact that if you do pure DevOps at the edge, uh, you will run into trouble because you don't patch a smart road infrastructure in the middle of the day when everyone is on the road, right? So you need to tweak DevOps and edge ops is our vision for that at uh, the Edge Native Working Group of the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, obviously, everything that we do is embedded in a wider uh, IoT architecture where edge computing is in the middle. And as you can see, we have projects, uh, 50 plus of them for IoT and edge computing at the Eclipse Foundation, plus a slew of development teams. Uh, 
not development ease, but development tools, uh, the traditional C uh, IDE is still going strong, but we've got Eclipse Shea and Eclipse Thea that are browser-based as well. So lots of tools to pick from in order to build IoT and edge computing solutions. So I put links to a few resources in there. Please feel free to visit the Gitter channel for the Zeno team to interact directly with the developers. And please visit the website for the Edge Native Working Group if you are intrigued by the prospect of this working group and want to learn more about the projects or even join the community. So thank you so much for watching my presentation. I'm Frédéric Desbiens from uh, the Eclipse Foundation. I can be found on Twitter as Bluebird Recorder. It's been a pleasure to uh, introduce you to Zeno today and I hope you will try it. So thank you for watching and see you around.